I'm Teresa Maddich with the Investing News Network. Here with me today is John Kaiser of Kaiser Research. John, thank you for joining me. Teresa, it's great to be here. Great. So, John, we've spoken many times, and I wanted to ask, you're not actually a geologist, so how can you be effective in this sector? By not being a geologist, I can ask questions which an ordinary geologist might be afraid to answer because he or she could be caught as not knowing something in a field that is actually very, very complex. So the dumb questions force the other side to give explanations, and if they're lying or, or, or just inventing stuff, it becomes very clear that they don't know what they're talking about. So that gives me an advantage, and then others, when they're on property visits, uh, the real geologists sit there and listen to the uh, you know, the amateurs' questions, and they also read between the lines, and they learn as a result of me asking what might be called dumb questions. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And I want to talk, one of the themes that you've been talking about a lot is China is going to cut down on pollution. They don't want to put up with this sort of deal they've made with the rest of the world anymore. Is that really happening already? Have you seen that starting to happen? What are some, some concrete evidence behind that? I have not been to China since 2006, so I do not have any first-hand experience that anything is actually being done. But we hear all the rumblings of uh, uh, measures being taken to uh, get the cleanup going. Now the problem is there is resistance at the local level with, due to corrupt officials. And part of the uh, uh, Xi Jinping's problem is that when Beijing says this needs to stop, this needs to be cleaned up, uh, they just laugh at him. So part of this political corruption crackdown that's going on right now is a re-establishment of top-down central command order so that when Beijing says this will no longer be done, it will be acted on at the local level. But fr from a broader perspective, China has to clean up. The people, as their middle class emerges, they shift from quantity of life to quality of life, and they insist on cleaner air, cleaner water, food that is not contaminated. And because of social media and the internet, the potential for an uprising based on pollution is, is very scary for the Chinese uh, bureaucracy. Okay. And in light of all that, one of the metals that you really like is zinc last time we spoke. So is that still the case? And if so, what are some zinc juniors that you like? Yeah, yeah zinc is a metal where China has gone from negligible production, neg negligible production in, in 1980 to uh, representing uh, almost 40% of global supply. And they do it from many smallish deposits. Many of them are uh, have have all heavy metals associated with it. Uh, uh, zinc zinc mines are implicated in the uh, soil study that concluded that the food chain is contaminated due to heavy metals in the rivers, which are the source of irrigation water for the crops. Uh, my belief is that Chinese zinc supply has peaked, may even decline. That is not what's being factored into people's expectations for stronger zinc prices, which is based on a depletion of several western mines with no new western mines coming on stream to replace that supply. And on top of that, China shift away from infrastructure and production capacity build out to more of a domestic consumption economy uh, means uh, more zinc consumption for things like appliances, cars, and so on. So we may get a demand boost that's more than just a GDP growth related, and then we have the depletion from uh, both Western and possibly Chinese uh, Chinese mines reducing the supply, and that's your classic supply-demand imbalance, which we witnessed in the uh, super cycle a decade ago for metals across the board, except this time it'll be uh, limited to zinc. Mm, that makes sense. Uh, and then also on China, I want to get your opinion on the recent fall in the Chinese stock market and the effect that that's had on commodities prices. In my view, uh, the Chinese government encouraged a stock market bubble in a misguided attempt to create a wealth effect 
uh, to offset uh, the uh, sagging real estate bubble that they have had going. And it has backfired on them. It appears to have pulled in uh, uh, individual investors uh, who have uh, lost a lot of money. The government is now trying to prop it up and have it sag slowly. But it is like a classic uh, uh, bubble collapse. And unfortunately, because uh, the margin calls and so on from leverage as high as five times rather than the standard 50% uh, uh, that, that's allowed here in the West, uh, um, we are seeing um, other assets that are hard assets, stuff like gold, copper, materials, all this stuff that had been put up as collateral for loans that were being used to gamble on securities, all of this is now being liquidated in the market. And, and I think uh, this, this, this capitulation washout that's happening now will have run its course by the end of August uh, as the Chinese bubble finally gives up. Okay, well hopefully. Um, and one last question because I know you talk a lot about exploration and one thing that comes up sometimes is in a downturn there's going to be fewer people going into the industry studying geology, mining, engineering, that sort of thing and when the boom comes back there won't be too many people left to do all the work. So is that a concern that you have? Do you see companies mitigating that risk? Well, the concern I have is I see massive shrinkage in the number of juniors that are in a position to employ geologists, field technicians, engineers, and so on. Um, I expect this universe of 1,500 companies to shrink to six, 600 companies uh, and maybe 300, 400 exploration juniors. Now, it could actually get worse because the, the regulatory system is mutating in a manner where it becomes very difficult for companies to get money directly into the treasury. And if we have this uh, extinction event happening, Canada will cease to be a source of geologists because for, for every uh, hundred uh, people who graduate from uh, in, in the geological field, uh, and there's going to be about a dozen that are really, really good, and there's going to be a bunch which are uh, you know, technically competent, and then there'll be the ones that are, that are not so good. And the juniors are kind of like a place where some of them go as a transition place, others go because they just weren't good enough to be hired by a, by a major exploration company. But it is a statistics game, and we need to have a large number of people trying their hand. Because who knows at the age of 18, 19, when you go to university, that you're going to end up being a top-notch geologist. You just don't know. So you give it a shot. But if you realize there's no jobs for it, you're not going to do it. And so Canada's capacity to churn out top-notch geologists and lots of competent geologists, uh, that will be compromised by the failure of the junior exploration system. Okay, and finally, John, one final question. What's the most interesting story that you've heard from a junior lately? The one I've been following, and my readers own it, I own it, is Eurovan Minerals. They developed a new exploration method that involves using a radiogenic uh, lead isotope uh, through geochemical sampling at surface in the Athabasca Basin to literally see a uh, uranium deposit up to 1,000, 1,200 meters uh, below the surface. And the big thing about the Athabasca Basin is it has the richest uranium deposits in the world, but as you get deeper into the basin, you do not see any geochemical trace at surface. Uh, you're relying purely on geophysics, but there are many spurious anomalies that geophysical surveys can generate. You blow your brains out drilling these types of targets. This company's developed a way where they're literally reading the uh, emissions of bacteria eating these uranium deposits at depth and it's sticking to the clay particles at surface and they just pulled a proof of concept hold at the Stewardson project where chemical is earning 70% and I think they now have the basis to go out there and look at other projects and see if there is a geochemically supported uranium target on it and this could revive interest in the entire Athabasca Basin all of whose good ground is owned by prospectors well, they're not prospectors anymore, they're just uh, online claim, claim stakers and other, uh, other juniors and even some majors. And many of these juniors are semi-dead 
companies and they're just at a loss as to what to do next. There is a potential now for a revival by generating new targets, teasing into view geochemically supported targets in the Athabasca Basin. And when you find the MacArthur River, that's a three to four billion dollar home run. That's a lot of upside for a sector whose company's market caps are below 10 million on average. Well, that's definitely an inspiring story. Thank you for joining me, John. Thank you, Teresa. I'm Teresa Maddich with the Investing News Network.